Hey YouTube, check this out. I got a new map. It's from a guy named John Gordon out of Germany. He's a photographer and he owns his own studio, but he also makes all of the props in the studio. And apparently he decided to get into the mat game and he did a really good job on it. So I think we'll use it for the video. Okay, so there's this one saying that goes, it's better to be approximately right than precisely wrong. It's normally attributed to a physicist named Enrico Fermi, more on him later. But in one short sentence, it also does a pretty good job of singing the virtues of estimation. Estimation in general is you just making an educated guess about the quantity of something, and you do it all the time. Say someone asks you how far away your favorite coffee shop is. Because it's a place that's familiar to you, you likely wouldn't take out Google Maps and look it up. You might just say a couple miles from here. Or say someone asks you how tall you are or how much you weigh. That one sort of depends on who's asking. If it's the DMV, you likely wouldn't take out a tape measure or step on a scale. You would probably just give them your best guess. If it's a dating website, you're likely lying about both. Six foot one and 180 pounds of pure intrigue. But when you try to overlay that concept onto card magic, now it gets complicated in a hurry because that one word encapsulates a lot of different ideas all at once. So we'll keep it simple for now by returning to the medieval game of how many jelly beans. Say I set down a single jelly bean in front of you and ask you how many jelly beans you're looking at. The fast instinctual part of your brain wouldn't even skip a beat because it would process the quantity, one, at the same time that it processes the object, jelly bean. I could do the same thing with five jelly beans because five is a number that you deal with all the time, every time you look at your hand. But now let's say I put down 25 jelly beans in front of you, but I put them in nice neat rows and columns, five by five. Even then you might still be able to use the instinctual part of your brain if basic arithmetic has become second nature to you. You just find the area of the square. But if I jumbled them all up first and then asked you the same question, now you have to switch to the slower, more thorough, logical part of your brain because you're going for accuracy, not speed. And it has to process the objects one by one. See, all of this happens because the quantity and the question make your brain choose between speed and accuracy. So let's change up the quantity and the question and see how your brain handles it. Now, instead of putting the jelly beans out one by one, I put a whole slew of them in a jar. And then I put that jar in front of you. And instead of asking you exactly how many jelly beans you're looking at, I change the question to about how many jelly beans are you looking at? Now your brain switches gears back to the fast instinctual part and it uses your previous experience to try to estimate how many jelly beans you're seeing. Because your brain has at least some experience with objects this big and containers this large, it wouldn't give you an outlandish answer like four billion jelly beans. It would give you a range that seems reasonable, like between 200 and 1,000. And as you gained more experience playing this game where you provided a range and then you were given the actual answer, that part of your brain, that instinctual fast thinking part, would get better and better at estimating the number of jelly beans it's looking at, to the point where it could get within 25 jelly beans every time. And that's the fascinating thing about that fast instinctual side of your brain. It's excellent at processing very little input or too much input for you to process consciously all at once, but it does rely on experience, so you gotta train it. Okay, so now let's take all this and wrap it in a pretty little bow and apply it to card magic, because there are two different styles of estimation when it comes to card magic. There's active and passive. Active means estimation is an action that you're taking. Passive means it's just an observation that you're making, either by sight or by feel. And the only difference between the two is what is the variable and what is the constant. If we were talking active estimation, that would be like me sliding a deck in front of you, asking you to reach down and cut off 15 cards and place it in my hands. The constant is the number 15, and the only variable is the number of cards that you actually end up cutting off the top of the deck. But what if we reverse that? What if instead I take out a deck, I cut off a small stack, put it in your hands, and then ask you to estimate how many cards I just handed you? Well, now it's a passive observing style of estimation because the action, me cutting the cards off the deck, is the constant. The number in your hands isn't changing. And the only variable is the number of cards that you think you're now holding. Now, before we go much further, I should probably explain why I'm beating the drum so hard on the idea of estimation. The truth is, it's this quiet cornerstone for a lot of different types of card magic, like the gambling stuff that I love so much. Dead cutting and stock controls rely heavily on your ability to estimate the number of cards or the size of stocks that you cut or that were cut for you on your behalf. And in memorized deck work, there are entire themes and styles in memorized deck work that are completely off limits to you until you can figure out how to estimate well, both in the active and passive form. So let's assume for some crazy reason, this is a skill you actually wanna develop. You wanna be able to pick up a certain stack of cards and know what range you're holding, or you wanna be able to cut at will a certain range of cards whenever you go to cut the deck. Useful skill, but you can't use the slow, thorough part of your brain to do it because there's too much information, too many variables. You got to use the fast instinctual part. 
and you gotta train that side of your brain with high intensity interval training. Essentially, you gotta put that part of your brain through CrossFit. See, the whole premise of high intensity interval training and CrossFit and stuff like that is that those people don't wanna be good at lifting weights, they wanna be good at getting their bodies to do whatever they ask of them at any given time. It's why bodybuilders could lift the side of a car but can't do 15 pull-ups, it's not how they trained. So the people who do that other style of training try to avoid doing the same exercises with the same weights and the same motions because they don't wanna be good at lifting things, they wanna be good at doing the work. So they climb ladders and they push over giant tires and they run up hills and they constantly change it up because they want their bodies to do what they ask. For that fast thinking instinctual side of your brain, you gotta train it in a similar way. It can be high intensity, meaning that you focus on estimation, both in the active and passive form, but you gotta give it a wide range of experience because that side of your brain isn't cumulative. It doesn't build up in steps, it builds up the same way that you experience the world around you, which is kind of all at once. We were talking active estimation, where you are manually trying to cut off a certain number of cards, put a little notebook next to you and put the cards in front of you and try to cut off 10 cards and then count them out and see how far off you were and then make a note in your little notebook. Then put the cards back and try to do the same thing for 20 and then 30 and then four and then 40 and then 15 and then 25, but do not do the same number two times in a row. Your goal is not to hit the number exactly, especially in the beginning. The only goal that you have is to notice the range, how far off you were from what you intended to cut. Are you high? Are you low? Are you dead on? And what you'll notice over the course of time is that the range that you cut at will get shorter and shorter until you're always within one or two cards of what you intended to cut. And the same thing goes for passive estimation, where you're not trying to control the number of cards that you cut, but instead the number of cards that you can feel or that you can see. In that case, start with the touchy-feely part. Put the cards in front of you, keep your notebook next to you, then cut off a small packet into your hands and try to guess how many cards you're now holding. And then immediately count them out and make a note in your notebook of how far off you were. And then on the next round, change the size. If you did small, now do big and then do the same thing on a small packet and then a big packet and then about half the pack and keep changing the size and your goal is not to be dead on when you guess your goal is to notice the range and shrink it now as for sight estimation you can't base this on anything that you touch because that will create an unconscious dependency so here's how you do that with the cards that are in front of you cut off a small packet and set it to the side and then give it about two seconds and then your goal is to estimate the number of cards that you left behind that delay will keep your brain from relating what it touched to the work it has to do next. And just like before, as you start to notice the range, whether you're high or low, you will eventually get better at this. Once you can do this reliably, once you can get within one or two cards each time, both actively and passively in a way that you can depend on, now it's time to study the incomparable work of the infamous Edward Mulkowski, or as you might know him, Ed Marlowe. Marlowe was born in Chicago, Illinois in 1913. And what's funny is to this day, his influence remains strong out there. You go out to Chicago and hang out with the magic scene and you will find it chock full of hardcore card technicians. And the coolest part about Marlowe is he was incredibly effective at exploring the soft edges on really cool ideas in magic, both in effect and in process. He was a tinkerer. Other people had explored the ideas of estimation, but always in a happenstance fashion. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, move on quickly. But Marlowe gave us a science. He gave us a process. When he wrote his pamphlets on estimation, there were two sections, mechanical and natural. The mechanical section was all about using tips and tricks to sort of guarantee the estimates that you were coming to. But the natural one was all about learning to trust yourself and the natural range that happens when you try to guess at paper this thin and still come to some really cool magical effects. And that's the lesson that I took from Marlowe was that even if there's a difference between what you expected and what you got within the confines of that difference, there is still room to do something amazing. And there's a really good reason for quoting the Nobel Prize winning physicist Enrico Fermi at the beginning of this video. Because just like Marlowe, Enrico Fermi was from Chicago. It's where he died. He taught at the University of Chicago and he was there when Marlowe was there. And what Marlowe did for estimation in magic, Enrico Fermi did for estimation in physics and it changed the face of the world. When Fermi was a professor, he was infamous for asking his students crazy estimation questions like how many piano tuners are in Chicago right now? Or how many golf balls would it take to fill up this classroom from floor to ceiling? They were questions designed to challenge the students to estimate things that they couldn't look up the numbers for and couldn't verify the answers to, but they had to come to a conclusion that they could trust enough to make a decision on. 
because that's exactly what he did. You see, estimation is all fun and games when you're talking jelly beans, cards, piano tuners, and golf balls. But it gets a lot more serious when you're talking nuclear physics and atomic bombs. You see, it was his ability to estimate, among a number of other qualifications, that got Fermi recruited onto the Manhattan Project, where he had the dubious task of trying to build the first atomic bomb to stop World War II. You see, when you do something like that, when you build the world's first atomic bomb, there are a number of questions that you have to answer accurately, but you don't have a point of reference for. Like, what is the power of the shockwave that comes off an atomic blast? When that question was asked, the mathematics to answer it didn't even exist. And the problem with a question like that is the only way to get an accurate answer is to set off an atomic bomb. So in 1945, at the Trinity testing site, we set off an atomic bomb on US soil. And there was a team of atomic scientists there with the best instruments that they could come up with to try to measure the yield of the blast and the shockwave that would ensue. Meanwhile, Enrico Fermi is sitting there tearing up pieces of paper. And right as the wind from the first shockwave is about to hit base camp, he steps outside and releases the pieces of paper into the air. And by observing how far back the wind from the shockwave pushed those pieces of paper from him, he was able to back of the napkin calculate that the minimum yield of that shockwave had to be greater than 10 kilotons, which was news to everyone there because there was no basis for a lower limit, the minimum amount of power coming off that shockwave. Anyway, after lots of measurements and analysis and checking their work, they determined that the best estimate for what the power actually was was 18.6. He was off by a factor of two, and this guy did it with confetti. Dude. Now I'm not telling you all this because I want to glorify the atomic bomb or World War II. Both of those things were horrible and millions of people lost their lives. And I do not want to give the impression that I hold Marlowe and Fermi on equal grounds. One is the godfather of card magic, the other one is the godfather of the nuclear age. The comparison isn't even close. But what I can tell you is that two boys from Chicago in the middle of the 20th century changed the way the world thinks about estimation. Marlowe did it with magic when he taught that even if there was a difference between the conclusion and the thing that you expect Expected, there was room enough in between those things to do something amazing. And Fermi did it with physics when he taught his students that even if there were a bunch of things that you didn't know, you could use everything that you did know to come to a conclusion you could trust. That you could take that conclusion, act on it, and change the face of a town, a company, a country, or the world. He did, and it did, and that is the power of estimation. Anyway. I'll leave links in the description below for some of the ideas that we went over here, including some bios for both Marlowe and Fermi. To everyone who has subscribed since my last video, welcome. This is what this channel is like. I talk about magic and some of the ideas outside of it that have influenced it for me, and I try to upload videos like this at least once a week. To everyone who was already subscribed and has been watching my videos and supporting me with comments and likes, thank you guys so much for the support. In the meantime, I'll see you guys soon.